description of this power shift, I, I think that's the best name possible because everything that you do, uh, that you want to change, you have to uh, ask yourself, is power shifting? Now this is a report at the highest levels of government and it ended up just words. Yeah. The students in 1970 with the first Earth Day I remember that very vividly. 1,500 events at 1,500 colleges and universities. Cover of Time, Newsweek, led the evening television news. Uh, that, uh, under the leadership of Senator Gaylord Nelson and others, others, that put the environmental issue on the map. Uh, the 20s are when you're most creative. You may have better judgment, experience, wisdom later on, we hope. But it's the 20s uh, that you're, you're, you're going to set the trajectory of your life. Uh, the whole economic model in this world is collapsing. It's the corporate capitalist model. So you, you have a great opportunity. You're not coming into a period uh, such as in the past where corporations are making a lot of profit and there was a relatively low uh, unemployment. You're heading into a, a, a depression. You're going to see what your great-grandparents or grandparents talk, talked about uh, when they talked about the 1930s. And that gives you a great opportunity to propose uh, alternative models. Uh, the cooperatives are an alternative model. The credit unions, you know, no credit union has gone out of business. The corporate institution, as an entity, should never be given uh, the constitutional rights of real human beings. For the corporate entity, in its modern form, was created in the early uh, 1800s uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and it was chartered by the state legislature. Corporations today are not created by investors. They're created by state charter, charters, Delaware charters, New York charters, etc. And the charter is a very weak mechanism. One is to basically say that only human beings should have constitutional rights, not corporations. So you subordinate the corporate entity to the sovereignty of the people and root it in, in our constitution. A constitution does not mention the word corporation. So how, how are they given constitutional rights? There isn't even a word, corporation, in the Constitution. The Constitution starts with we the people in the preamble. It doesn't start we the corporations. As corporations should be prohibited from engaging in electoral activity, prohibited from lobbying, prohibited from doing the kind of things that only human beings should be allowed to do. I mean, corporations, uh, you know, they don't vote, they don't have children, they don't die in Iraq, they make money in Iraq. Uh, it's the people. And so the, the, this is called the subordination movement. Subordinating the corporate entity to the sovereignty of the people. Because right now what's happened is the people uh, are, have been subordinated to the sovereignty of the corporation. Why don't we have some strings attached to all this? Well, why do we develop Taxol, which is an anti-cancer drug at the NIH with $31 million in taxpayer money, and then give it to Bristol Myers Squibb free and let them charge a woman with ovarian cancer $14,000 for six treatments. So we see the and, and so the question is, we own the greatest wealth of this country. Now, the public airways, the public lands, the R&D, and your parents' the trillions of dollars of pension uh, money, uh, which actually control, would control the New York Stock Exchange companies. If people controlled what they own, controlled what they own, those of you who are going to law school, you know, ask them why they don't ever, ever talk about the Commonwealth owned by the people of this country but controlled by the timber, gas, oil, television networks, TV stations, drug companies, and so on. That's the system of control that has to be broken. And that's what's broken by subordinating that corporate entity. As Barry Commoner, the great uh, environmentalist at Queens College uh, in New York said, the first rule of environmentalism is everything is connected to everything else. This is why, uh, you know, when we see the word pollution, it really is violence. And until we begin to convey the devastation of health and safety and, and uh, the biota uh, as violence, we're not going to grab people's attention. And that's what it is. I mean, it creates cancer. Isn't that violence? It uh, poisons water and contaminates food. Isn't that violence, it produces respiratory ailments. Isn't that violence? Uh, so, it's silent violence. The second way to cut corporate power, in addition to subordination, is displacement. And displacement is local action incarnate. For example, every time we put 
uh, more, we expand the credit unions and democratize credit, we cut the power of the Bank of America and Citibank and all these other giant uh, banks. Nuclear is trying to make a comeback after we blocked it and stopped it. There hasn't been a single nuclear plant that's come online uh, since uh, the 1970s. But every time, now they're coming back saying that they don't produce greenhouse gases. But how do you think they enrich your energy? Uh, they burn enormous amount of coal uh, to enrich uh, uranium. But more to the point is that you can, you, there'll never be a nuclear plant built in this country without a 100% taxpayer loan guarantee from Washington. That's what they're demanding because they can't get financing from Wall Street, not even 90%. They got a 100% guarantee against losses and defaults to get the money from Wall Street to build the nuclear plant. And as, as long as we can stop the loan guarantees here in Washington, we can completely cut off any kind of expansion of nuclear power. Amazing. Imagine spending eight, nine, ten billion dollars for a 1,200 megawatt nuclear plant with the radioactive waste, with the tailings and the uranium mines, with the securities problem, uh, all the things that are involved with nuclear uh, power. And its, its principal function is to boil water. All this complex nuclear cycle, it's all to boil water, to produce steam. Uh, and we haven't got better ways to do that. Thank you for the signers, by the way. Thank you for doing that. Uh, the important thing uh, to remember here is how do you deploy for that shift of power? And this is where your political science classes have to become much more empirical. Uh, You've got to do it through three mechanisms. One is the governmental mechanism. The second is the small business renewable energy type sub-economy. And the third is in the way you do your choices, in the way, you know, what you buy, what you don't buy, how you use what you buy, and so on. And 1,500 or so corporations get their way with a majority of 535 members of Congress. These corporations have no vote. We have the votes back home and we are not organized. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of focusing on your state reps and your local reps and, and your members of Congress in that manner. And you outnumber the corporations. Uh, you can outwork them. You can out-energize them in this very personal mode. You can't outspend them in this very personal mode of campaigning where you get to know the staff. You get to know the friends, you get to know the children of the members of Congress. Now get some citizen skill courses in your curriculum. Uh, you should be getting credit for learning how to be a skilled citizen. Don't you get credit for learning how to market, how to be an accountant, how to computer design? Well, that's all for selling stuff. But the most important skill is how to practice democracy. The last thing I want to point out is you've got to develop a civic personality. Developing the ability not to be discouraged not to be demoralized, not to uh, burn out, uh, the, the skill to, uh, to give people credit. Don't try to hog the credit. Uh, the skill to keep reading. How we need a carbon tax, not this ridiculous uh, cap and trade. Uh, and how, how they're doing it is they're regulating price, not supply. And so they're regulating price in terms of the externals, externality and so forth to favor renewables and to disfavor fossils. Your generation may be the last, the last, to be described as the generation that had to give up so little in order to change so much. The soundbite expert of the 20th century, whose name was Mahatma Gandhi, he had seven deadly social sins. Politics without principle. Politics without principle. You're in the capital, uh, reflecting that one. Second, wealth without work. Third, commerce without morality. Fourth, pleasure without conscience. Fifth, education without character. Sixth, science without humanity. We've seen that at universities servicing ever more lethal weaponry and research, like at Livermore and University of Wisconsin, working over the years on the, the most deadly weapons 
in the history of humankind. And seven, worship without sacrifice. I would add two more. Belief without thought. And the second is respect without self-respect. It's time really, I would say, to redefine patriotism as a stand for justice, recalling the final words of the Pledge of Allegiance, which is with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much.